Well, you may have missed the news last summer, uh, but Ted Kaczynski died in federal prison at the age of 81, and his death didn't elicit much sympathy, understandably, because Kaczynski, more famously known as the Unabomber, had been convicted of mailing bombs to people. And, and he, had, he had killed three, he maimed many more, so he was a, just a sick and evil man. No excuses for the, doing something like that. And there's reason to believe that Ted Kaczynski kind of got messed up because he was a victim of the CIA's controversial MK Ultra experiments, which we've briefly mentioned <clears throat> in our times together, but bear a closer look because some blame these experiments for at least partially contributing to Ted Kaczynski's mental illness. I suppose we'll never know for sure, but what we do know is that the American government during the Cold War tried to brainwash unwitting Americans in the name of national security. And this somewhat disturbing story sets up the premise of today's message quite strikingly, so bear with me. To understand Project MKUltra, we need to understand the historical context as the Korean War was dwindling, uh, dwindling to a stalemate in the early 50s. A dread of communism was washing over the Western world. For example, Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA, was warning the country that returning American POWs had been indoctrinated by communist operatives. And he publicly condemned the communists for their unethical and deplorable mind control experiments. But, privately, he gave the green light to the CIA to catch up with their communist counterparts with their own secret brainwashing experiments. And this covert operation was codenamed MKUltra. <clears throat> now, I suppose that if someone gave consent to be experimented upon, then that's their own business. For instance, Robert Hunter of the Grateful Dead reportedly enjoyed getting dosed with LSD and other psychedelic drugs. But many of these experiments were performed upon unsuspecting subjects or those who were coerced, and it really messed them up. Military officers and CIA agents were unwittingly dosed with LSD, and many of them thought they were going crazy, and it, lead to at less, it led to at least one suicide. Also, prisoners and mental patients were coerced into participating. It's terrible. The CIA even experimented on people in foreign locations just to avoid pesky obstacles like the United States Constitution. Experimenters use electroshock therapy, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, and abuse in an effort to erase the subject's mind and rebuild it with whatever message the United States government deemed appropriate. Think of the Manchurian candidate. Crime boss Whitey Bulger claimed to have undergone such experiments while in prison in Atlanta. And he was mad. He wanted revenge. <clears throat> I suppose you can use national security concerns to justify any evil. And these secret experiments went on for the better part of 20 years. But then in 1973, Watergate happened. And suddenly, everyone deemed more transparent, or demanded more transparency from the government, understandably. So Richard Helms, the director of the CIA at the time, saw the handwriting on the wall, and he ordered all records about MKUltra destroyed. So that was that, right? So all we're left with is the speculation and testimony of mob bosses and psychiatric patients, right? Well, not exactly, because the CIA missed a box of MK Ultra papers that had been stored in the wrong place. Thank goodness for government incompetency. And after the New York Times started to leak some of these reports, Senator Frank Church of Idaho opened an investigation, and the Church Committee uncovered the truth about what had been going on. Thousands of subjects had been put through this terrible ordeal. And it was all illegal. So does this story sound too far-fetched for you to believe? Crazy conspiracy theorists? But all the details are available for public consumption via the church report. And the following, and following the recommendation of the church committee, President Gerald Ford mercifully banned all such experimentations by executive order that we know of. So what did the CIA operatives learn from all of this? Well, they learned that um, illegal drugs can really, really do harm to people. They discovered how fragile the human mind really is. In fact, the human mind is just as breakable as the human body. But ultimately, the government learned that mind control is not feasible. People could not be forced to believe things they did not want to believe. 
nor could they be made to do things that they did not want to do. You could break them, but you couldn't control them. The United States government may be powerful. It's not that powerful. But do you know who's even more powerful than the United States government? It was Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus may have been the greatest man of all time. And when I say the greatest, I mean the most powerful man in the history of the world. Caesar Augustus was so great, in fact, that the Roman Senate bestowed deity upon him. Wow, I'm glad the U.S. Senate doesn't have that kind of power. Though I wouldn't be surprised if they tried. But that's how revered Augustus was. And he ruled his subjects with absolute power. In fact, the Roman Empire may have been the greatest empire the Western world had ever known. But was Augustus really all powerful? Was he so powerful that he could force people to think how he wanted them to think, feel how he wanted them to feel, and believe what he wanted them to believe? Could he control their insides? Because during the rule of Augustus, around 4 BC, one called the Son of God was born. He had no political authority. He had no power in the conventional sense of the world. But Caesar couldn't force this Son of God to be anything he didn't want to be. Ultimately, he was free. And the Son of God has passed this freedom onto you. So the only question remaining is, Will you exercise that freedom? Or will you remain bitter, angry, and enslaved by whatever powers you think control your life? Well, let's take a look at this today. I'm going to encourage you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Luke 2, 1 through 14. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take out one of ours from the shelf underneath the pew in front of you. Pull out that Bible and just turn that to page 857. 857, we'll go straight to Luke 2, or use your smartphone to scan the QR code on the worksheet in your bulletin. We all know the story of the three kings, right? Never mind the fact that they weren't really kings according to Scripture, and there are probably more than three of them. But did you know that the Bible mentions at least four real kings in association with the Christmas story? So we're going to talk about one of these kings each week uh, and the four weeks leading up to Christmas. Last week, we started with King Herod, and King Herod worked hard to keep the people of Judea under his control. He even was willing to kill people. Herod may have been powerful, but he was a failure as a result, so failed to the king. But even King Herod had a boss, and his name was Caesar Augustus. But while Herod was hated, Augustus was worshipped. Some even suggested that he was the son of of a god. Now that's power, right? And his tentacles reached all over the western world, even to a little town called Bethlehem. So let's look at Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says this, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and lied him in a manger, because there's no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger." And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now we've heard this passage a million times, right? 
And as a result, we sometimes tune it out. We especially tune out the first couple of lines about Caesar Augustus because we want to get to the Christmas part, right? But we can't overlook the political backdrop of the Christmas story because it's crucial in understanding the rest of the story. And we see at the beginning of this passage that a decree went out from Augustus that everyone in the world should participate in a census. Now, Caesar Augustus didn't ask permission from anyone to take this survey, and he didn't politely request that everyone participate. It was a decree, and whatever Caesar wanted to happen, happened. It didn't matter how inconvenient it may have been at the time for people. Even women who were eight months pregnant were forced to travel at their own expense to their ancestral homes and register for the census. And it wasn't for their benefit, mind you. They didn't get a prize for registering. They did it to benefit Caesar. They did it to get taxed. And this was a census of the entire world. The Roman Empire of Caesar Augustus encompassed the entire Western world at the time almost. The emperor ruled almost all of Europe. He ruled Asia Minor, the Holy Land, and much of the Middle East. And for good measure, he conquered Northern Africa too. The population of the Roman Empire reached perhaps 45 million under Augustus's rule, and it was an extremely diverse population. All kinds of languages were spoken to the numerous people groups represented throughout the empire, but Augustus was able to somehow hold them all together because he had ushered in what is now known as Pax Romana. He put an end to wars for the most part. There was finally law and order, and Augustus built roads. People could travel uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the world in relative safety, at least safer than it was before. And with this time of political stability came economic prosperity. People didn't need to worry about marauding hordes destroying their property. It wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Rome was no utopia, but it was the next best thing. People craved stability, and Augustus provided it. He had subjected all these different nations under one banner, and everyone was afraid of him. Augustus was all-powerful. But all this power hadn't come without a fight. We need to understand this. This is important. You see, the Augustus, before Augustus was Caesar, he was just a guy named Octavian. But he had a very powerful great-uncle named Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a powerful general who took over Rome by force. He became a dictator. And, of course, some folks in the sin. Senate didn't go for that, and on March 15th, 44 BC, they stabbed him in the back. Literally, they turned him into a pincushion. But before his assassination, Julius Caesar had named Octavian his heir. So as his adopted son, Octavian inherited Julius Caesar's land, money, and most importantly, the loyalty of his legions. And after some political jostling, Octavian won the Civil War and became the undisputed ruler of Rome. But he had some help from the heavens. Shortly after Julius Caesar's assassination, a comet appeared in the sky. And Octavian claimed that the star signified Julius Caesar's deification and entrance into heaven. In other words, Julius Caesar became a god. And that made Octavian, by proxy, the son of a god. He took the title Caesar Augustus, and he was also referred to as Lord and Savior. Oh, really? Was Caesar Augustus all of that? Because a rival was born just under his nose, according to today's passage. But this rival wasn't interested in Caesar's land. He didn't care about Caesar's money. He sure didn't need an army. This rival was born in obscurity. He was laid in a manger far from home. He was surrounded by shepherds, yet his birth was good news for all the people, it says. They were the beneficiaries of his reign. And this Savior, which is Christ the Lord, would win the hearts and minds of the people, not through coercion, threats, and manipulation, but through love and simple truth. There would be peace on earth, but not by the sword. He would bring great joy and tranquility and happiness to people's souls no matter what their political circumstances. And this is the good news. The good news is that God loves you, and he is the true immortal God, not some star moving across the sky. 
And his son, the humble carpenter of Galilee, would reveal him to everyone. He was a God of grace and peace and love. He was a God without an army or a physical kingdom. He was not a God who won wars, but who won hearts. He was not a God who conquered and killed, but one who gave his own son to die on the cross. And the Son of God backed up every claim he'd ever made by rising from the dead. So let's see Caesar do that. And he promised salvation, forgiveness, reconciliation, and eternal life as a free gift to anyone who would receive it by faith. God has saved you just because he's good. According to his son, Jesus said, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So we see that Jesus, though he had all the same titles as Caesar Augustus, was in fact his opposite. <clears throat> Caesar Augustus was the son of a so-called God, and he sent out decrees forcing people to do exactly what he wanted them to do for his own monetary benefit. But that's as far as his power went. He could only seize their property, their money, and even their physical bodies if necessary, but he couldn't take their souls. Those for the one were for the one and only Son of God to win. And win them, he did. And so our main point from today's passage is this. It's in your bulletin if you'd like to write it down. The main point is no Caesar can seize our souls. No Caesar can seize our souls. When addressing all this political hand-wringing, Jesus gave this pointed command to his followers in Matthew 10, 28. Jesus says, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Caesar Augustus was one of the greatest men in the history of the world. And he, you know, he truly was amazing. He was a great general. He was an incredible administrator. He was lauded and respected. He instilled fear into people. No one crossed Caesar Augustus. He was a king. He was a dictator. He was an emperor. He was the son of a god. He held all the power the world had to offer. He could degree to what he wanted, and people had to do it. But no matter how much worldly power he wielded, their insides were still outside of his jurisdiction. Just as the CIA learned with Project MK Ultra, Caesar had no control over what happened in the hearts and minds and souls of men. You might be able to break somebody, but you can't control them. He couldn't force anyone to think or feel anything they didn't want to. Souls can't be defeated. They can only be won. Souls can't be stolen. They can only be handed over voluntarily. And Caesar, for all his power, couldn't circumvent people's God-given free will. He couldn't make them think a certain way, nor could he make them love him. So in essence, Caesar, when you think about it, had no control over people. Sure, he could force their bodies to go this way and that. He could even kill them. But to force a change on the insides of people in the ways that really mattered, he was powerless. No man can do that. No government can do that. Folks, not even God does that. That's how free you are. The omnipotent God, the all-powerful God, he could change your insides if he wanted. Force, he could force it. He could force you to think a certain way. He could force you to feel a certain way and just follow him all the time, but he doesn't do that. He gives you free will. So you are free, indeed. And folks, this is so important for us to understand because many of us have allowed those that we think are in charge to ruin our lives. We've allowed the government to make us feel insecure. We've allowed our bosses to make us unhappy. We've allowed our parents, as well-meaning as they may have been, to maybe rob us of peace and joy. We've allowed our political parties to tell us how to think. We've allowed our churches to manipulate us into doing certain things. And then we complain about it. Oh, do we complain. We complain about our government and political leaders, and I know the Bible says we are to respect those in authority, so I try to do that. But I'm also compelled to tell the truth, and the truth is our leaders, for the most part, are petty, self-serving, and vindictive. If you haven't noticed, we're in the midst of a political, uh, a presidential election campaign, 
and unfortunately, someone's going to win that election. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if the voters just said, you know what, we don't want any of these people. We're just going to pass on this round, and we're going to govern ourselves for a while. But folks, President Biden has no control over you. Governor Reynolds has no control over you. Where it counts on the inside, you are free. And this isn't some political philosophy, by the way. I don't care if you're a socialist or a libertarian. This is a spiritual philosophy. And this philosophy declares the following. It declares that the combined power of the federal, state, and local government has no real control over you. The powers that be can drag down the economy. They can make ridiculous laws. They can meddle in schools and businesses and health care. They can fill up the news cycle with self-important bloviations. They can crank out propaganda. They can try to induce panic and fear in the population. But they cannot touch your soul. They can't control your mind. They can't make you feel a certain way. They cannot manipulate your personal hopes and dreams and values unless you allow them. They cannot move your soul unless you permit it. They are powerless to control what matters most in life. So it doesn't matter how tyrannical a government may be, or your boss, or, or your, your, uh, your pastor. They have no real control over people. It's just an illusion of control. It's control that the people choose to hand over. They can seize your body cannot confiscate your soul. I can't think of a more tyrannical government than that of the Nazi party during the 30s and 40s. The Nazis maniacally clamped down on all forms of resistance. They pumped out propaganda day and night, and they controlled every aspect of government, business, media, education, and religion. But it couldn't, they couldn't rein in the autonomy of the human soul. One such example can be found in a courageous young woman named Sophie Scholl. As an idealistic child, Sophie Scholl was enamored by the rhetoric of the rising Nazi party. But her father was not. As a committed Christian, he saw right through it. He saw the evil. He did not toe the party line. But during Sophie's time at the University of Munich, as she became an adult, she began to see things her father's way. This was back when universities actually fostered freedom of thought, by the way. And as a free thinker, Sophie started to question what she was hearing in the classroom, in the news, and even in the state-sponsored church. If an organization had to use force, then maybe its arguments aren't that strong. And when Sophie's brothers returned from the Eastern Front and told her about the horrors the Nazis had perpetrated in Poland and Russia, she was determined to resist. But she wasn't a fighter. She didn't believe in violent resistance. But she, should, she could start a moral and intellectual resistance. And that's what the White Rose Movement was all about. Sophie joined a small group of students, including her brothers and a brave psychology professor named Kurt Huber, to secretly distribute anti-Nazi leaflets. And they were quite effective, actually. People found solace in the knowledge that they were not alone in their suspicions of the Nazis. And one day, the members of White Rose were quietly scattering leaflets all over campus. Sophie even pushed a stack off a railing, causing them to rain down on the main hall of the university. Well, she was spotted by a Nazi sympathizing janitor, and he called the Gestapo. And now, upon her arrest, you may be tempted to think that the young, naive university student would ultimately fall back down to earth and sing like a bird to save her own skin. But she didn't. Sophie would not give up her co-conspirators under interrogation, nor would she allow the police to change her mind. Folks, she was like 19, okay? And toward the end of her sham trial, she was asked if she'd like to renounce her previous actions and philosophy. Here's how Sophie responded. She said, I am, now as before, of the opinion that I did the best that I could for my nation. I therefore do not regret my conduct and will bear the consequences that result. Sophie and her brothers were sentenced to death by the Nazi regime and guillotined on February 22nd, 1943. But even to the very end, they did not waver. So do those sound like the words of someone who's controlled by a tyrannical regime? 
No one could tell Sophie Scholl how to think. They couldn't convince her that she was wrong. They could take her head from her, quite literally, but they could not steal her soul. They were powerless against her in the ways that really mattered. They were terrified of her, actually, because they knew that she was free. She was the president of her own life. She took responsibility for everything she said, thought, and did. She took full advantage of her God-given free will. And free will is God's gift to you. God has given you control of your life. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 from the Old Testament. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, God says, that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. Clearly, God wants you to take responsibility for your soul. That's what we see in the Christmas story. That's why the author didn't fail to mention the political context. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stood in direct philosophical opposition to Caesar Augustus. Caesar had seized power and control, but Jesus relinquished it. After all, the humble baby lying in a manger can't tell anyone what to do. Yet everyone came running to him with great joy. And so our application from today's passage is this, and it's in your bullets. And the application is, take control of your soul. Take control of your soul. Remember the disciples? They had followed Jesus. They loved Jesus. But in the book of Acts, Jesus had left them with the responsibility of spreading his message. And at that point, they took control of their own souls. They didn't let anyone else control them. But the religious authorities sure tried. Just like the Gestapo, they arrested the apostles and demanded that they stop talking about Jesus. But the, the apostles demonstrated just how powerless the authorities actually were. Look what they said in Acts 4. It says, So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And just like that, the religious leaders were exposed. For all their bluster and demands, the apostles simply said, no, nah, we're not going to listen to you. So the religious authorities tried another approach we see in the next chapter in Acts 5. It says, when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were accounted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that, the, that Christ is Jesus. When the apostles realized that they were indeed free to govern their own souls, they rejoiced. The governing authorities were powerless to stop them from talking about Jesus they had tried throwing them in jail. They tried beating them up, but they couldn't touch what was most precious. As long as the apostles took control of their own souls, then the authorities couldn't touch their hearts or minds or lives. Now, you and I don't live in ancient Palestine, nor do we live in Nazi Germany, thankfully. We have freedom of uh, religion, freedom of speech, freedom of thought here in America. So be free and enjoy your free will. It's the greatest gift God could have ever given you. Delight in it. But even if we didn't have political freedoms, no one can control your soul. And so take control of your mind. Don't let anyone else tell you how to think, not even a preacher or a theologian, because God has shown you the truth in Jesus. 1 John 5.20, the apostle says, And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding, Jesus. And so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And don't let any politician demand that you toe the party line. 
Don't let the popular agenda of the ruling elite push you around. And whatever you do, don't listen to the religious establishment. Jesus told us that. You listen to him. Listen to what you know is true from the deepest center of your Jesus being. Listen to those who genuinely have your best interest in mind. doesn't mean we don't listen to anybody. But listen to those who genuinely have your best interest in mind. But don't let anyone control how you feel. There are those out there who benefit from you being angry and miserable. In fact, they want you to be just as angry and miserable as they are. But no one has that kind of power over you unless you relinquish it. No circumstance can force you to be angry or miserable because you are in control of your emotions. And there are those out there who benefit from you being afraid, especially religious types. Just turn them off. Jesus doesn't want you to be afraid. Matter of fact, it's never God's will for you to be afraid, according to the Apostle Paul. For he said, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and what? Self-control. Look at that. God has given you a spirit of self-control. So control yourself. And this doesn't mean that we become our own gods, by the way. We can always take this to the extreme, right? And, and say that, you know, we become our own gods. Jesus is still the Lord, right? Jesus is still the Lord. But you know what? He's not a tyrant. Look in the book of Revelation. This is Jesus' own words speaking. He says in Revelation 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. And so Jesus knocks at the door. He doesn't knock down the door. So we choose to submit to him. We joyfully do it. We do it voluntarily. Why do we do it? We do it because Jesus is awesome, and he's the Lord. He's God, and he has our best interest in mind. And Jesus is so, imagine this, Jesus is so secure in his lordship that he doesn't need to force anyone to do anything. He relinquishes control over our souls to us. That's biblical. He gives us free will. Why do you think everybody does such horrible things in our world, right? That's what true love does, by the way. And so what are you going to do with it? Well, I've decided I'm going to relinquish it back to him because he makes me the happiest and he truly has my best interests in mind. It makes me the best possible person. It gives me peace and it would solve all the problems in our world if we all did that all the time, right? I relinquish control back to the Lord, the true son of God. But he's so, he is so secure in his lordship. He doesn't need people. He doesn't need to force people to do anything. That's amazing, isn't it? So what are you going to do with this gift of free will that God has given you? Think about how valuable that gift is. The God who could have just made everybody do whatever he wanted all the time. He's given you free will. What are you going to do with that gift? As much as the authorities of this world would like to think otherwise, no one controls you. I mean, yeah, they can control like circumstances and, and, and things like that, but Caesar cannot seize our souls. No one can change our minds, our hearts, our hopes, our beliefs, or our dreams unless we relinquish that power to them. So take control of your soul. That doesn't mean you become your own God and push away Jesus. No, 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 no. Take control of your soul from all these peoples and entities that would try to control it for you and relinquish that control to the true Lord who truly has your best interest in mind. Jesus was humble, but Jesus didn't let anyone tell him what to be, nor did he coerce people into doing what he wanted them to do. See, Jesus leads an all-volunteer army. No one's forced into that army. He has given you the gift of free will. And so be free. Caesar Augustus was the greatest king the world had ever known. But a millennium before him, there was another king. He didn't rule the whole world, but he was the first king 
to rule the small Semitic nation of the Hebrews. And in some ways, the Christmas story began in earnest with his reign. And so I'm going to encourage you to read Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38 this week. Luke 1, 26 through 38. And bring a friend next Sunday as we invoke the name of David and bestow upon that name upon this newborn king. Let's pray. Lord, as I look out on all these people, I thank you that I look out on <clears throat> free beings. You have, you have given them the gift of free will. They are free. Every person in here has free will, God-given gift. And Lord, there are so many entities and people and philosophies that don't seek to win us over, but just seek to control us through manipulation or force and fear. <clears throat> God, I pray we would take, take back the control of our souls, that you have given us the gift of free will. You've given us the responsibility of how we think and feel and, and the philosophies that we carry. I pray we would take control back from these entities who would try to steal it from us, be it the government, be it our job, be it our churches or whatever. And we would listen to you who truly has our best interests in mind. You who never seeks to control people. Help us to submit to the true son of God because, Lord, you have won our hearts. We love you. Thank you, Lord, for all the good that you do to us, <clears throat> do for us. And God, we pray we would go out and enjoy this freedom you've given us to the fullest. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.